All right, so our story begins with what is now called Stuart, England. Tudor Stuart, England. When I did master's work out at Eastern some years back, I took a course called Tudor Stuart, England. And at the time that I, my first class in that uh, uh, particular course of study, I knew nothing. I'd never even heard of Stuart, whatever they called it. I knew nothing about it. And I didn't know why anyone else should care about it. And I had a wonderful professor out there who uh, was able to inspire, this in the late 70s, and open a vista of new appreciation, at least in this young guy's heart, on this subject. And ever since then, this has been one of my favorite chapters of the entire history of the planet, is Tudor Stuart England. So if you notice, I get a little juiced up about some of this. There's a reason for it that has been around for a while. Well, we've looked at the Tudor piece, starting with Henry VII up to Elizabeth, and of course she dies without any children. And so the heir to the throne, as it turns out, would be the ruling family in Scotland. We mentioned to you last week that had Elizabeth died earlier, Mary, Queen of Scots, was actually in line to become the subsequent ruler. Well, obviously she died before Elizabeth did, and because Elizabeth executed her. And so uh, that leaves her son, who was James VI of Scotland, to become James I of England. So this is the Stuart. The Stuarts had ruled Scotland going clear back almost to the time of William Wallace. We talked about that some weeks back. And now the Stuarts are going to move into um, England. Uh, Stuart is spelled either way. I've seen good, credible sources spell it both S-T-E-W and S-T-U, so I'm just by a convention going to use this particular spelling. If you object, it's fine. God bless you. You may be right, but I can't figure out who's got the right answer, so I'm just flipping a coin, and that's how I'm coming up with this one, but I grant you may see it either way. James VI became the king in Scotland after the death of his mother, which was in 1560, uh, after the abdication, I should say, of his mother, in 1568. John Knox, who was the dominant force religiously and in many ways politically in Scotland, preached at the coronation of James. He was only about three years old at the time, so I don't know how much he appreciated the sermon. But Knox did cast a vision for what he saw as the prospects for Scotland. He had worked this out. We've talked about Knox now in some detail already, so it's just refreshing your memory. He had worked out a fairly sophisticated vision of political and ecclesiastical life in Scotland based around what we would call the presbyterial theory of authority. Namely, that authority is not vested intrinsically in persons, but is vested in offices, which are held only for a term or a time, and then relinquished to a successor to the same office. Those offices have limited authority. There is checks, balances, division of labor. All of those things that we rather take for granted were really sort of an innovation of Knox, who got his inspiration from Calvin. And that's what Knox was arguing for. He wasn't arguing against a monarch. He was willing to grant a position of the monarch, but he was arguing for what came to be called constitutional monarchy, where even the authority of the king is curtailed by law. Even the king has to obey the law. That was a radical and upsetting idea at the time, especially for rulers who were committed to divine right theory to hear that there was something above them that limited their own authority was a little bit of a galling idea to many, including our friend here, James VI. And so even though he was reared in a highly Presbyterian kind of culture, he himself over the years became increasingly hostile to it. I think it's of the nature of being a king to be hostile to the idea that someone wants to limit your power, you know. And James, even though he was in this, what we would consider to be a a very rich and nurturing tradition, nevertheless gradually began to push his authority a little bit beyond the bounds of what certainly Knox would have endorsed. Knox died in 72. But the ongoing vision of Knox was certainly part of the culture there, the political and uh, ecclesiastical culture of Scotland. 
And it did almost come to blows at one point, so to speak. I mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago the interesting conversation between James VI in Scotland and a man who was a, a high political authority in Scotland at the time named uh, Edward uh, Melville. And it was in that connection that Melville said, you are God's silly vassal, you see. You usually don't say that to a king. And he said it because James was trying to assert his rule into the church. And at least one of the most basic distinctions that was at work in Scotland at this time, what we call separation of church and state, didn't quite look the same then, but it was the same idea. It was already in place. And here was the king trying to insinuate his authority into the life of the church. And this high-ranking churchman said, back off, pal. There is a different king over here. And in this particular institution, the church, you're just another rank-and-file member, you see. And that was the kind of conversation that was going on. James in Scotland wasn't able to push his authority beyond that. He didn't have the political clout or horsepower to do that. He did, however, develop a little phrase, and you may have heard this, it may be the single most famous phrase associated with James, in which he said, no bishop, no king. This became kind of a philosophy to which he himself was committed. In order to have a true monarchical political authority, you have to have a monarchical church authority. If you don't have a church organized around a bishop, you will not for long be able to maintain a king. He understood that the church and the state, in a sense, had to mirror each other in their authority system in order for one to keep the other propped up, and that ultimately the two authorities should unite in the highest authority in the land, the king, who in a sense becomes the king of both institutions. That idea that he was embracing, no bishop, no king, was going to be one of the fundamental themes of his entire career as a ruler. And it certainly was one of those things that created some degree of tension between him and those who were serving with him and under him. So anyway, James, in spite of his Scottish roots, didn't become a good Presbyterian at all. He was more or less kind of defining himself in a rather different way. Well, in 1603, Elizabeth died having ruled, having been a dominant influence in England, of course, for some 50 years, a brilliant ruler. Um, and, uh, but she finally uh, went the way of all flesh. And so that brings now James to the throne as James I of England. And if he was hoping that he would get a more sympathetic hearing to his political philosophy in England, he was gravely mistaken because when he wound up in England, what he found was there was a parliament there dominated by a highly articulate and very influential minority called the Puritans. Now, the Puritans, you know, got their start before Elizabeth with Mary Tudor. They had fled, at least these English Protestants had fled Mary Tudor's reign. Most of them went to the continent. Most of them inculcated the vision of John Calvin. Many of them were in Geneva or other Reformation cities. When they came back to England, as Elizabeth took the throne, they were very happy to hear that the English church was going to be Protestant. They weren't so happy the first time they went to church and it felt so Catholic. And so these who had come back now were disappointed that the church was not embracing a more robust expression of the distinctive flavor of the Reformation on the continent, the Lutheran Reformation, but more particularly the Calvinistic Reformation. And so they set about within the church to start trying to steer it in a direction they thought had greater integrity with respect to the Reformation. They earned the epithet early on of being Puritans, and that is the term that stuck. It was originally intended as an insult, and interestingly, to this day, if somebody calls you puritanical, that's usually viewed not as a compliment. But nevertheless, these were very intelligent people who were attempting to try within the structures of the church, not from outside, to guide it in this direction that they thought would be better for the church and better for the people of England. Well, by the time we get to James, 
This Puritan presence in England has become very conspicuous and very influential in virtually every part of English society. There were many high churchmen in the Anglican church in England who were nevertheless fundamentally Puritan in their outlook. The Puritans, this is important, were distinguished by the fact that they did not leave the Anglican church. They worked from inside it. That's what makes them different from the nonconformists who were outside the church, the independents or the separatists. The Puritans stayed within. They also found themselves in rather significant and influential roles in politics. And so many of them had successfully run for election to Parliament, and Parliament was populated by a goodly number of these Puritans. They also had made it into upper uh, positions of uh, responsibility in the scholastic world in England. Oxford and Cambridge both had significant, prominent scholars who were Puritans. They had also become very invested in the business world in England. So in other words, you found Puritans all over the place. But they weren't, they weren't crazy. You see, they were really working and very productively doing things that was actually generally viewed favorably by many English people. Even if they weren't subscribing to the overall outlook, in many ways they were viewed as those who were doing good things. So that's what James confronts when he takes over in England in 1603. A very robust, powerful Puritan presence in England, and he knew that he had to carry on a fairly delicate dance with these people. Even though he didn't share their political outlook, he didn't have in England, as he didn't have in Scotland, the ability to just drop an iron fist and have his way. And so, as has often been the case, politics is a matter of compromise, and that's what James found himself having to do. He made many compromises. When he first took office, he was confronted with what was called the millinery petition. The millinery petition was allegedly a thousand requests, hence the name millinery. It came from the Puritans. It was a request for James to make all kinds of adjustments. Some were fairly minor, some were fairly significant. The Puritans knew they wouldn't get it all, but hey, you throw a thousand things at the wall, maybe some things will stick, you know? And so they, they gave to James this millinery petition. Many of them, James was able to accommodate. They weren't huge, you know, catastrophic things from his point of view. One of them, probably the most famous, was there was a request on this list, the millinery petition, for a new English translation of the Bible that would have the authority and the sanction and the imprimatur of the, of the King of England behind it. In other words, they were asking for an authorized version. Now, the only Bible that had been around until that time, in the Eng well, there'd been two. There'd been the Wycliffe Bible, and then later, of course, the uh, um, uh, Tyndale Bible. There was the Geneva Bible as well. But the point is, the Tyndale Bible had probably been the most visible Bible there in England up until that time. It had never really been officially endorsed. Tyndale had, of course, translated it and paid for that project by being burned at the stake in 1536. His dying words were, his last quote was, Lord, open the eyes of the King of England, Henry VIII at the time. Henry VIII, two years later, authorized the distribution of the Tyndale Bible throughout England, which Henry himself regretted eventually. But that did make it more or less ubiquitous throughout England. And so the Tyndale Bible was out there, and many people had it, and it was used commonly, of course, in the church. It was an excellent translation, but it still kind of had that stigma that it, there'd never been really an officially endorsed version. By this time, Greek manuscripts had been improved somewhat, and we knew that there were some points where the translation might be uh, improved slightly, and so this was one of the requests, and, and James agreed. And so over a period of a few years, the King James Version of the Bible was produced. It represented about 85% of what was in the Tyndale Bible a great credit to Tyndale. They just borrowed straight from Tyndale for the most part. They did tweak some texts, they did adjust some others, so there, was, there were some adjustments along the way. But basically, Tyndale had, had, an, had done an excellent uh, job of producing that Bible and, and really uh, what came out. When you're reading your King James Version, I know many of you in this room, as I, most of us with gray hair, grew up 
on the King James Version, right? That's what I memorized as a kid. And, uh, and uh, you know, it was good enough for the Apostle Paul. It's still good enough for me. But nevertheless, uh, you know, I'm glad for the kind of proliferation of translations these days. I think that's great. But one thing we have to grant is that has been a very powerful product of this era of the history of the church in England. And so I think we can be grateful to James uh, for granting that request on the millenary petition. Something else that happens about this time is there are, is a request for the authorization of a new company. Companies at the time were a fairly, uh, well, they were an innovation that had only taken place within the last 20 years or so. They began really in Holland. Companies were a product of the Reformation. Before the Reformation, trade relationships with foreign countries trade expeditions, exploration, and so on, were done in the style of Spain, where the monarch would put the money up and send them off and hope to get the return from it. And the idea of private investment was almost, uh, nobody even thought of it, you see. But the Reformation created this notion of a more free and open kind of participation in economic life and was creating a rising middle class with the means to do that And first of all, in Holland, which had the most kind of religious tolerance going, these companies began to develop. The most famous, of course, was the Dutch East Indies Company, where you don't have the king or the ruler financing it, but private money is coming in. It's a wonderful way, you see, to hopefully realize some gain, and at the same time, there's a kind of stop loss built in. If you, if you lose, you just lose your investment. You don't necessarily lose your shirt. And so there is this idea that you can invest and maybe see some gain from it. Elizabeth had actually experimented with companies in the last few years of her reign. And so the British East Indies Company was actually formed in the last about five years of Elizabeth's reign and had some modest success. And again, In England, there had not been any official investment by the throne, simply a kind of stamp of approval. This is something that's approved by the state, but nevertheless carried out, more or less independent of immediate state control. Well, when James came along in 1603, the proposition was put to him that he should authorize a company not to the east, but to the west, because now there was an awareness that we have this amazing uncharted territory there to the west, And so James actually did, in fact, authorize that. The two companies that are most famous that were formed under James are, as you're well aware, the London Company, first of all, and then the Plymouth Company. I know you all learned this in high school U.S. history. And all I'm doing now is dusting off a couple of cobwebs. So I'm not going to spend much time on this, but I think, in fairness, we should at least mention it, don't you? because it is the beginnings of our life here, and so we don't want to do, uh, be too cursory in treating it. So anyway, these two are authorized under James. The London Company sailed in 1607, four years after James had become king. Off they go. They established Jamestown, as you know, for James, and they also called the broader region Virginia in honor of Elizabeth. So all of that should be... Uh, pretty much uh, familiar to you. The first governor was a guy named John Smith. He presided over devastating, horrific losses. Jamestown, now first of all, I think has to be said in fairness, was primarily organized for purposes of profit. There was a hope of seeing revenue. The investors were hoping to make a buck. And at least at the beginning, it didn't look like it was going to turn out that way. John Smith himself, of course, experimented for a while in a kind of communal uh, experiment. It's almost a communist kind of approach. That didn't work then, usually doesn't. And so he was uh, feeling the losses there. There is apparently that wonderful moment, which we're all familiar with, where he was actually about to be executed by a local Native American uh, judicial tribunal in Pocahontas jumped in and threw herself over him to protect him. That did apparently happen. Now, Disney's version of this is accurate at that point only, you know. Uh, So, um, 
But I, I will give credit there. Uh, she did seem to intervene. She had some relationship and became quite an important mediator, it seems. She was a remarkable woman, for sure, between this uh, Jamestown colony that was struggling and the Native American population that was there in that vicinity. She did eventually marry one of these guys, but it wasn't John Smith, it was a man named John Rolfe. John Rolfe was one of the early experimenters in the first crop that appeared to have some prospect of success and make the Jamestown effort actually make a little money for its investors, and that cash crop was called tobacco. That's right, and so John Rolfe, who was a Christian, and was uh, a participant in this uh, community, was one of the first to begin trying growing tobacco. And it was discovered fairly quickly that that would actually possibly create a kind of economic boon for this region. He also fell in love with Pocahontas. She was quite a well-known person in this community by then. He was concerned about marrying her because as a Christian he knew that it wasn't advisable to marry someone who didn't share his Christian faith. And at that point, she was still of the religious outlook of her Native American background. And so he wrote in a private letter to someone that he thought he might go ahead and marry her anyway in the hopes that through marrying her, she would come to faith in Christ. Not an approved evangelistic strategy. So uh, I know sometimes people try that, but in this case it worked. She did, in fact, marry John Rolfe, and at least at some point along the way, she did, in what appears to be a very deep and sincere fashion, embrace the Christian faith. There are very well-known paintings of her being baptized and so on, and so that does seem to have been a real heartfelt action on her part. As you may know, Pocahontas traveled to England, and she was kind of a little bit of a a showpiece there. Uh, she was very famous, very well respected, and given a lot of attention and so on. She was used kind of to make the argument that these Native Americans could actually be converted to the Christian faith, which some people doubted, you see. That was kind of a time in history, as I think you're aware, when people had some strange ideas. But anyway, she obviously and evidently was a true Christian, and so that did seem to inspire some interest and in more missionary effort and interest in the Native American population here. Unfortunately, she, of course, uh, died only three years later. I think the common wisdom is she picked up some bug for which she had no antibodies, you know. This was English uh, germs that she was dealing with, and she wasn't uh, equipped to, so she, she fell ill with some uh, illness and died in 1617. The church in Jamestown was the Anglican church. It was the established church. I think the common view is that the leadership of that church at that time was not strong. These were not high-quality clergy uh, men who were involved in the leadership of the church, and the general spiritual tone of Jamestown seems, on the whole, not to have been overly healthy. That seems to be a common report from various uh, you know, historians who've looked at that. So for whatever it's worth, you wouldn't say Jamestown was distinguished uh, conspicuously by any sort of uh, strong Christian sort of commitment at the core of the culture that was there, but certainly they were Christian, and they viewed themselves as representatives of the outlook of the Church of England, which uh, was part of their whole uh, culture. Jamestown, as you know, finally became profitable based on tobacco trade and the rest, as they say, is history. So I'm saying Jamestown was too cold, spiritually now. Now, the Plymouth Company, which overlaps Jamestown, I'm going to say is a little too hot, but their story, I think, is worth hearing, and so, again, you may be familiar with this, but just for purposes of getting it back in front of us. I was mentioning earlier that in England, under James, there were two sets of Christians who followed the Reformation. The Puritans, who remained inside the church, and labored within the church and were really within the social order, ecclesiastical, scholastic, etc., trying to bring about a transformed England along the lines of the Continental Reformation, especially the Calvinist Reformation. There were also another class or another group of Christian people following the Reformation who basically abandoned the church and in some ways kind of abandoned the whole culture. They came to be called separatists, or independents, or nonconformists. 
James had much less sympathy for them. They had much less political power in England, so he was really free to be a little more harsh in his treatment of them. The Puritans had a fair amount of horsepower behind them, and so James had to be somewhat politic in the way that he handled the Puritans. These people, however, were true dissenters, true outsiders in some ways, and James was somewhat more ferocious in penalizing them for their wayward ways, so much so that in the same year that the London Company was sailing off to the New World, these people who were there in England migrated away from England to Holland, wound up in Leyden in uh, Holland, and this was under William Brewster. And so these folks, uh, in order to escape religious persecution in England, went to Holland. Holland was by far the safest place for religious dissenters. It was a refuge, there was a no official uh, religious uh, imposition of, of some kind of uh, demands, creedal demands or any such thing. So it was, it was a place of some degree of religious tolerance. And that's where these folks wound up and they lived there for some years. However, after being there for a few years, the parents began to get a little nervous because they saw their kids running around wearing wooden shoes, you know and beginning to talk with a little bit of a Dutch accent. And they were picking up the rap music that they were hearing on the street down there in Amsterdam. And, you know, they were, in other words, these distinctively English parents were seeing that it was only a matter of time and they were going to lose their identity. If they stayed there for many more years, their children were going to turn out being more Dutch than English in the long term, and they were concerned about that. And so these folks who are now English people in Holland are laboring between two tough choices. Stay in Holland, lose our English identity, go back to England and maybe be even worse off. They had hoped that things would change for the better in England. Actually, they were changing for the worse. Life was becoming even more painful for nonconformists in England, so what to do? And it, of course, came to them that maybe there's a third option. Maybe we should start our own company. And so representatives of these who are there in Holland approached the London Company, now called the Virginia Company, and proposed a new company, and it came to be called, of course, the Plymouth Company. They could only afford one ship, and so our famous Mayflower was that ship, and it sailed in 1620. William Bradford was the governor, and the entire project was more or less a kind of shoestring operation compared to what the London Company had been. Now, I want you to just at least entertain the thought that when Jamestown was mostly for profit, this particular venture was mostly for freedom from religious persecution. The reason I mention that is because I think you know that there's a debate that goes on to this day in which you'll hear people say, the people that came to America came for religious freedom. And then you'll hear someone else say, no, 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 they just came over here to make a buck. You ever heard that debate? That's kind of going on. And the, 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 the problem is both are trite, are, they're both true. Uh, there was mixed motives at the time, but it's certainly safe to say that at least some of those who came were coming precisely to escape from the hostility toward their religious outlook in England. And that would be largely these folks who came to be called the Pilgrims. And they show up, and as I say, Bradford was their governor. The most famous uh, document that comes out of that is, of course, the Mayflower Compact, a remarkable document, fairly brief. And uh, because it's brief, I'm going to read uh, this to you. It does give us something of the spirit of what these people were thinking about. There was, they, they lost about four in the voice. What is it, 102 or so were on the Mayflower. They lost about four. Before they stepped on shore, they all signed off on this document. Quote, in the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign, Lord King James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France and Ireland, king, defender of the faith, etc. You always say nice things about the king. The word dread there doesn't mean bad, it just means, wow, that guy's amazing. Uh, 
And also, the king of England still claimed to be the true king of France. You know that. So at this point, uh, they include France on the list and it uh, goes on from there. Having undertaken for the glory of God and advancements of the Christian faith and honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents, solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil, civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid, and by virtue hereof to enact, constitute, and frame, there were lawyers among them, obviously, and such just and equal laws, ordinance, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. And witness whereof we have hereunto subscribed our names at Cape Cod the 11th of November, late in the fall, by the way, in the reign of our sovereign Lord King James of England, France, and Ireland, the 18th, and of Scotland, the 54th, 1620. The Mayflower Compact. Distinguished, I think, for several things. First, for its robust Christian affirmations. Secondly, for its clear and evident submission to the, the throne. They were not trying to be a, a, the least bit or appear the least bit rebellious. And yet, for the designs they had to really establish what would amount to a Christian community. And that does seem to be the driving vision that was behind them. So the Mayflower uh, group lands and establishes the uh, Plymouth Colony. As you probably know, they lost about half of their population over that first winter, a dreadful winter, but they were helped out by a wonderful uh, local Native American, Squanto, who was able to step in and give them some help. Slow growth, uh, the Plymouth Colony grew over 40 years from uh, whatever, you know, after they lost about half their population, so about 50 up to about 2,000 by the year 1660. So it was still a fairly modest size group by that time. The third of these colonies is not under James, but is under the successor to James, who is his son Charles. Charles I has an interesting story. I'm only going to tell a little bit of it this morning because I want to talk about the Massachusetts Bay group. But Charles... Um, I think the general perception of him was he was not only committed to the Anglican church and the Anglican vision of a kind of monarchical state of the church and state of the state, but he may even been down deep inside a Roman Catholic. There was certainly a widespread concern that Charles was at least deeply sympathetic to Roman Catholicism, which raised in many English folks a high degree of concern. He was married to a Roman Catholic wife, a French woman whose name was Henrietta Marie. And so this really did represent in the minds of many the prospect of a reintroduction of a Roman Catholic challenge to England, which of course for some time had not been as much of a threat. The debate had been more intramural now between the Puritans and the Anglicans, if you will, but now to see what appeared to be maybe a new shot coming from the Roman Catholic world was of grave concern. It was in that spirit that uh, uh, the parliament that was convened by Charles early in his reign essentially uh, resisted him and resisted him fairly sternly. Parliament had the power of the purse, and so for Charles to run his administration, he needed money, and the money had to come from taxes, and the taxes had to come with the approval of Parliament. And Parliament was not in any mood to just give him, you know, a carte blanche here. So they laid some very significant restrictions on him and said, you know, if you want money, here's what we want. And the demands, from Charles' point of view, were untenable. And so Charles dismissed the parliament and ran the country as the king without parliament for 11 years, almost unprecedented. He had to live on a budget, you know. Uh, the revenues that he got during those years were largely from certain excise taxes that would flow to the throne. And he also got a fairly healthy stipend from Louis XIV, who was the king of France. So he was able to sustain himself, but not in a very luxurious ma fashion during those 11 years, but he knew the parliament, dominated by Puritans, was going to give him nothing but grief. And so for 11 years, that's basically what's going on. 
If you know the story, of course, you know that uh, Charles eventually was forced to convene Parliament because of a Scottish revolt. Trust the Scots, you see, to, uh, to step up and, and kind of pick the fight here, and that's what happened. And so that gives rise to a whole series of events that eventually leads to, of course, the execution of Charles the first, but I want to save that discussion for uh, next week, so we're going to leave off, but I do want to take a look at this, um, uh, the development of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. The, the main henchman that was working for Charles was a guy by the name of Archbishop Laud. Archbishop Laud was sort of like Cardinal Richelieu, you know, back in France. He was a, he was a churchman, but he was also a very powerful political factor and figure in English life, and he set about a fairly severe policy of, of going after and punishing uh, uh, in various kinds of ways people who in some cases were arrested on trumped up charges and were being uh, you know, brought into kind of a star chamber sort of thing. And, his favorite punishment was to lop off the ears of people that uh, didn't agree with uh, you know, the particular uh, laws he was imposing, that kind of thing, or cut off their nose, that sort of thing, to mutilate them as a kind of public tribute. So it's an awful sort of thing, and he won a fair amount of negative sentiment among the English. It's no accident he was eventually executed himself, you know. So, uh, but anyway, uh, it's during this time that we have this more this rising crescendo, as it were, of hostility now between the crown and this Puritan population. You know the name John Bunyan. John Bunyan was born in 1628. So he was born right in the middle of the reign of Charles. I'm hoping, if time permits, to highlight his life a little bit next week. He, of course, is the author of the most famous allegory in the world, uh, Pilgrim's Progress, and he lives really during this era, so it's the backstory for his own life that is before us here. All right, well, there in England, there were these folks still representing the Puritan population who were faced with a very difficult choice. Do we stay in the old England and attempt, by resisting this imposition of force against us, to bring about a better England, or do we leave and establish a new England? And in that place, without the immediate encroachment of this kind of uh, kingly authority, create a society that is much more consistent with what we understand to be the designs of a body politic tracing back through Scotland, really, and back to Calvin. And that's what was in these people's minds. So many people stayed, some people left. And the people that left, of course, were those who established what's called the Massachusetts Bay Colony. As I was saying to you a little earlier, really the defining document and vision and philosophy of this was the sermon that was preached by Winthrop. It's quite a remarkable document called A City on a Hill. Uh, I might just mention in passing, Harvard was one of the first institutions founded by these folks. It was founded in 1536, the colony was established in 15, 1632, so just four years later, John Harvard, strong Christian, strong committed to a kind of Calvinistic theology as all these people were, establishes Harvard precisely to have an educated clergy and to have the opportunity for people to have advanced uh, education and understanding of God's word. And uh, God bless that institution. And uh, we still, of course, know about Harvard, don't we? Well, uh, by 20,000, by, uh, not 20,000, by 1660, there were 20,000 people in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. The growth was much more rapid than in the Plymouth Colony. I'm not saying that's significant, I'm just noting it as a matter of historical fact. At this point, you've got about 2,000 in Plymouth, you've got about 20,000 at Massachusetts Bay. The Massachusetts Bay philosophy was what I think is an attempt to balance the two interests religious, uh, freedom to practice religion along the designs of the Reformation, and a strong desire to make money, that is, to be profitable. Both of those were consistent with that 
view that had gone back through the Reformation. And so we've talked about that before. They were trying to incorporate both. The Puritan work ethic was alive and well at Massachusetts Bay, and at the same time, they were trying to do it in a way that they believed was honoring to God and faithful to an understanding of a religious practice uh, that uh, came to them through the Reformation. The City on a Hill sermon is quite lengthy. It would probably take 45 minutes to read it all, so I'm not going to do that. I would like to read its conclusion, and I hope you'll just bear with me. I know that sometimes being read to at too much length can be a little bit uh, stultifying, but uh, this is so wonderful, and it was so defining of the early days of our philosophy as a nation, and it continued to be referred back to. JFK, of course, famously quoted from the City on a Hill sermon. Ronald Reagan did. Others have. It's been one of those documents that just has had a kind of vibrancy down through American history. We haven't heard so much about it lately. Just saying. But uh, nevertheless, I think it, it's good for all of us to review it occasionally. So uh, this, these are the concluding three paragraphs of this sermon. Quote, this is Winthrop. Now, he's made quite a case for the way in which these folks need to conduct themselves in this new venture, this new England. And he's concluding then with these words, quote, Thus stands the cause between God and us. We are entered into covenant with him for this work. We have taken out a commission. The Lord hath given us leave to draw our own articles. We have professed to enterprise these and those accounts upon these and those ends. We have hereupon besought him a favor and blessing. Now, if the Lord shall please to hear us and bring us in peace to the place we desire, then he hath ratified this covenant and sealed our commission and will, ex and will expect a strict performance of the articles contained in it. But if we shall neglect the observation of these articles, which are the ends we have propounded, and dissembling with our God shall fall to embrace this present world and prosecute our carnal intentions, seeking great things for ourselves and our posterity, the Lord will surely break out in wrath against us and be revenged of such a people and make us know the price of the breach of such a covenant. Now, the only way to avoid this shipwreck and to provide for our posterity is to follow the counsel of Micah, to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God. For this end, we must be knit together in this work as one man. We must entertain each other in brotherly affection. We must be willing to abridge ourselves of our superfluities for the supplies of others' necessities. We must uphold a familiar commerce together in all meekness, gentleness, patience, and liberality. We must delight in each other, make others' conditions our own, rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together, always having before our eyes our commission and community in the work as members of the same body. So shall we keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The Lord will be our God and will delight to dwell among us as his own people, and will command a blessing on us in all our ways, so that we shall see much more of his wisdom, power, goodness, and truth than formerly we have been acquainted with. We shall find that the God of Israel is among us, when ten of us shall be able to resist a thousand of our enemies, when he shall make us a praise and glory that men shall say in succeeding, gener succeeding plantations, may the Lord make it like that of New England. For we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us, so that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work we have undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and a byword through the world. We shall open the mouths of enemies to speak evil of the ways of God, and all professors for God's sake. We shall shame the faces of many of God's worthy servants and cause their prayers to be turned into curses upon us till we be consumed out of the good land whither we are going. And to this short discourse and that exhortation of Moses, that beloved servant of the Lord in his last farewell to Israel, Deuteronomy 30, beloved, there is now set before us life and death, 
good and evil. In that we are commanded this day to love the Lord our God, to love one another, to walk in His ways and keep His commandments and His ordinances and His laws and the articles of our covenant with Him, that we may live and be multiplied and that the Lord our God may bless us in the land whither we go to possess it. But if our hearts shall turn away so that we do not obey, we shall but be seduced and worship other gods, our pleasure and profits, and serve them, it is propounded upon us this day we shall surely perish out of the good land whether we pass over this vast sea to possess it. Therefore let us choose life, that we and our seed may live, by obeying his voice and cleaving to him, for he is our life and our posterity. And I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that a great deal of the blessing that we continue to enjoy is God answering a prayer prayed 400 years ago. And I would like for us to keep refreshing our memory a bit as to that prayer and to the great answer that I think God has given us and a response to it.